Hey gang, welcome to another edition of Pulp Today. I'm going to start by talking about fashion. Mm. Well, I'm going to start by taking a drink, then I'm going to talk about fashion. The clothes that I wear when I record these things are the suits out of my own closet, obviously. None of them are appropriate for the material that I've been reading. They are, uh, some of them are vintage like this one, uh, but they are all in the style of roughly the early 1960s, because that's what I like. Uh, I used to have more 30s, 40s, 50s stuff, but it fell out of my, uh, fell out of my wardrobe, and it wasn't crazy about the, the wide lapels, which were in, in fashion at the time. But I like to look nice while I'm doing these, so this is how I dress. The hat. Let's talk about the hat. Why the hat? First, I used to hang out a little bit in the vintage-obsessed crowd, and uh, always drove me crazy that the guys wore their hats inside. Drove me crazy. Don't wear your hats inside. What I'm doing right now, big no-no. But there's a reason I'm doing it, and here's the reason. Pow! That's crazy, right? Um, because of the plague, uh, and because I hate having my hair long, I shaved my head a couple of weeks ago. I made sure to record about six episodes of this before I did that so that I could have a couple of weeks to grow back a little bit. But I'm still, day one was Lex Luthor. I think I've made it as far as Private Joker from Full Metal Jacket, but I still don't feel quite myself. Uh, so I don't think you want Lex Luthor reading Pulp Fiction to you, so... I will break the rules of fashion and wear a hat inside because nothing breaks the rules of fashion more than being a bald guy. It's totally unfair. Um, today we're also going to break the rules of Pulp Fiction a little bit by talking about Pal Joey by John O'Hara. John O'Hara was a big deal in his day, and I think it's I think it's odd that he's no longer as big a deal. He wrote some great novels, uh, one of my favorites called Appointment in Samara, uh, referencing the folk tale about the uh, inescapability of fate. Pal Joey is, uh, I'm going to not pronounce this word right and I don't feel bad about it, epistolatory, epistolary novel, novel made up of a bunch of letters, um, which connects to the thing I said in the Tarzan video about the here's a manuscript I found in an attic thing rather than presenting uh, a novel as written by the author. But these are, uh, these were originally published, this is Borderline Pulp, they were originally published in, uh, I think New Yorker magazine? Yeah, 3940. Special thanks are due the New Yorker, in the pages of which most of the chapters of Pal Joey first appeared. This is the first Penguin Books edition from 1946, uh, which I read about 20 years ago, I think. Um, about 20 years ago, when I was reading Pal Joey, I was spending an uncomfortable, well, I was comfortable, an absurd amount of time in nightclubs, particularly the Dresden Room in Hollywood. Mm. And I hadn't started singing there yet. Uh, but it was a very, it was a, it was a particular kind of a life, and some of that life is uh, captured, even though it's set many, many, many moons ago in Pal Joey. Um, which is about a uh, sort of a, a, an anti-hero nightclub singer. Uh, it was turned into a musical in 1940, shortly after the book. Uh, book was by John O'Hara, and uh, Rogers and Hart is the play, is the musical, I think. Anyway, uh, Gene Kelly, it was his first big part. He was sort of brought up from the chorus. He had played a tap dancer in an adaptation of uh, Soroyan's Time of Your Life. He'd been a chorus boy and some Cole Porter things, which leads to my favorite bit in Singing in the Rain, where he shows how you do less and less as a performer the more money you make um, in the Broadway melody uh, montage. Um, and then it was made into a movie in 57 with Sinatra, who, man, I wish I'd seen Kelly play the part, but... It was written for Sinatra, I think. Uh, he was Pal Joey in more ways than uh, maybe even he was comfortable with. Um, 
but it includes uh, a lot of great songs, including I Could Write a Book, which I have been known to sing at the Dresden Room, um, and with Howard Chaikin once at a comic book convention. Video for that's on Instagram somewhere. Um, so this was kind of in its day presented as high art literature, but it's very much about a marginal character who speaks very much in the language of the time. And it's written in, the character's name is Joey Evans, it's written in Joey Evans' voice. The uh, letters are to a pal named Ted. And uh, it's uh, written in a great 19, late 1930s, early 1940s uh, urban nightclub dialect and in a great sort of stream of consciousness tumbling out of this guy who is not supposed to be a writer. Uh, I'm going to read probably the first two, three pages. Uh, and uh, I'm going to read it fast because I think that's the way it's written. Dear pal Ted, well, the last time getting around to knocking off a line or two to let you know how much I appreciate it, you sending me that wire on opening night. Don't think because I didn't answer before, I didn't appreciate it, because that is far from the case. But I guess you know that, because if you knew when I was opening, you surely must be aware how busy I've been ever since opening night. I figure you read in variety what date I was opening, in which case I figure you've been, you have seen the write-up since then telling how busy I've been, and believe me, it's no exaggeration. Well, maybe it seems a long time since opening night, and in a way it does to me too. It will only be five weeks this coming Friday, but it seems longer considering all that has happened to your old pal Joey. It's hard to believe that under two months ago, Joey was strictly from hunger, as they say, but I was. The last time I saw you, August, remember the panic was on. I figured things would begin to break a little better around August, but no. A couple of spots where I figured I would fit in didn't open at all on account of bankroll trouble, and that was why I left town and came out this way. I figured you live in a small town in Michigan and you can stay away from the hot spots because there aren't any and that way you save money. I was correct, but I sure didn't figure the panic would stay on as long as it did. I finally sold the jalopy and hocked my diamond ring the minute I heard there would be a chance down this way. I was never in Ohio before, but maybe I will never be anyplace else. At least I like it enough to remain here the remainder of my life, but of course if the NBC is listening, I'm only kidding. Well, I heard about this spot through a little mouse I got to know up in Michigan. She told me about this spot as it is her home and town, although spending her vacation every year in Michigan. I was to a party one night, private, and, then, and they finally got me to sing a few numbers for them and the mouse couldn't take her eyes off me. She sat over in one corner of the room not paying any attention to the dope she was with until finally it got so even he noticed it and began, began making cracks, but loud. I burned, but went on singing and playing, but he got too loud, and I had to stop in the middle of a number, and I said right at him, if he didn't like it, why didn't he try it himself? Perhaps he could do better. The others at the party got sore at him, and told him to pipe down, but that only made him madder, and the others told me to go ahead and not pay any attention to him, so I did. Then when I got finished with a few more numbers, I looked around, and the heel wasn't there anymore, but the mouse was... She didn't give me a hand, but I could tell she was more impressed than some or the other that were beating their paws off. So I went over to her and I told her I was sorry if I embarrassed her, me calling attention to her dope boyfriend, but she said he wasn't a boyfriend. I said, well, I figured that. I said she looked as if she could do better than him, and she said, you for instance. And I said, well, yes. We laughed and got along fine, and I took her home. She was staying with her grandmother and grandfather, two respectable old married people that lived there all their lives. They were a little too damn respectable for me. They watched her like a hawk, and one o'clock was the latest she could be out. That, to me, is the dumbest way to treat that kind of a mouse. If it is going to happen, it can happen before nine o'clock. And if it isn't going to happen, it, doesn't, it isn't going to no matter if you stay out till nine o'clock the next morning. But what's the use of being old if you can't be dumb? So, anyway... Nan told me about this spot down here and knew the assistant manager at a hotel where the spot is, and she said she would give me a send-in, and if I didn't hold them up for too much of the ready, she was sure I could get the job. I sing and play every afternoon in the cocktail bar, cocktail bar and at night I relieve the band in the ballroom. Anyway, I figured I would have to freshen up the old wardrobe, so I had to get rid of the jalopy and hock my diamond ring. I made the trip to Ohio with Nan and her own jalopy, which isn't exactly a jalopy, I might add. 
1937 Plymouth Conver Convertible Coupe. It took us three days to go from Michigan to Ohio, but I'll thank you not to ask any questions about my personal life. <laughs> ah, I love that book. Anyway, that is Pal Joey from 1939-1940, uh, a beautiful evocation of a time and a place and a kind of a character and a kind of a lifestyle. I hope you liked it.